And I want to, first of all, invite Sean Mitchell, the man who did these interviews to come up here. Where is Sean? I know he's here someplace. Where are you, Sean? Come up here. And this guy, you know, if it wasn't for people like him, I couldn't be on television. We couldn't be sharing these testimonies. And these testimonies are seeing great, great results. So I'd like you to introduce Mike and tell a little bit about this testimony. And then we're going to ask Mike to come up here and share a little bit with you. Okay? Well, I'm usually on the other side of the camera or the stage or whatever. So this is kind of new for me tonight. But I'll tell you what. I have the great privilege to produce these stories. And I'll tell you, it's been such a great opportunity for me. I mean, I'm producing healing journeys. I'm producing some of the financial stories and also the destiny stories. And one thing that um, Stephen, who's our director of our department, he pretty much says that everybody has a story. And it's so true. And what's so neat about that is that your story will turn around and it will bless somebody whether you think it will or not. And the more and more I do these stories, the more and more I see that. Because, I mean, they touch my heart every time I go out and I, and I see these stories. In January, Stephen gave me an uh, uh, assignment. And uh, this assignment was back here in the U.K. I was back here this last May, and I did Richard Waller's story, and I did the McDermott's. And just being here and, and seeing, you know, those families and their lives changed and see what God is doing in their lives now is just a huge opportunity for them and just for our ministry. But uh, January I was given this story, and the story uh, happened to be in Ireland this time. And so in April, I went to Ireland and uh, met the Mullins family. And I'll tell you what, um, if God works in, in families and, and, and things like he did in this family, the world will be changed because I'm seeing it every day and just what, what it's doing. And, and these stories, I hear the stories. I, get, I still get stories from, uh, you know, our le- le- emails and stuff from uh, people saying, man, that story was so good. Or I'm seeing, you know, w- you know the results of what you guys are sending in. It's been awesome. But right now, what we're going to do is we're going to show just a short little video that's going to introduce Mike Mullins, and then I'm, we're going to have him come to the stage and tell his story. I saw a little lump on his back, and I remember that cold feeling as a cold hand gripped my heart. Our 17-month-old little baby boy was diagnosed with stage 4 neuroblastoma cancer. He had cancer in every bone in his body. body. We are the ones who are carrying him. We are the ones who are crying, confused and wondering, God, how are we going to get through this? God, what is your will in this situation? I, I seriously believe that it could possibly be God's will for him to die and I couldn't understand it. How could God ordain a child that is a victory child than to die at age two? I just couldn't get my head around it. We had people saying to us, well, God needs another little angel in heaven. Or, you know, God is trying to teach you something through this. Our God is showing you how much He loves you. We had someone actually say that because of all our years in ministry, that God actually counted us worthy now to have a child with cancer. Someone sent us a CD. I think four CDs together. And it was handwritten on it, you know, uh, God wants you well. It was like water to a parched soul. Could it be true? And the good news is not just positive thinking. It is the gospel. It is the good news of Jesus Christ, we believe.
God is truly good. A wise person once said that nothing is impossible with God. The impossibility lies with us when we limit God with our unbelief. Um, Andrew uh, was diagnosed with this stage 4 cancer on the 25th of February 2011. And it started off with a lump on his back and his behavior was very erratic. He would hurt himself and bang his head on the floor. And and we couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. And when we were told that news that he had stage 4 neuroblastoma cancer, we really didn't understand. You know, we didn't understand cancer. And I naively asked the consultant, how many stages are there? And she said, this is the final stage. And the prognosis was very, very bad. And... um, well, we did what we, what we thought that you should do straight away as a good Christian, even Jonathan. We mobilized prayer. We got as many people to pray as possible. Isn't that the right thing to do? I mean, you got a problem. Well, you need to get as many people as possible to pray. So we actually started a Facebook page, and we called it Pray for Andrew. And we quickly gathered thousands of people following him. Uh, at the time, I was a director of a, a, quite a prominent Christian charity in Ireland, had been for you know best part of a decade. And so internationally, we, we mobilized tens of thousands of people to pray. So he was reaching nearly 4,000 people on Facebook, yet his progress was very small, was very little. And I remember one time, very early on in his diagnosis, I was in Crumlin Hospital in Dublin, and I went to the kitchen. And now, Andrew had been very bad. He wanted nobody else to hold him except me. And I was very exhausted, and the whole side of my face was all scratched because this cancer attacks the nerves. And uh, he, he had cancer in every bone in his body. Well, really, every bone except his hands and his feet. He also had a tumor measuring 7 centimeters by 8 centimeters by 21 centimeters. And it was wrapped around his spine and in through the holes in the spine, and he was all the time screaming. And um, that was very, very difficult as a parent to see this happening to your child. So the lump that we saw was actually the tip of an iceberg inside. He was 17 months old at the time. My wife, incidentally, was um, seven and a half months pregnant with her sixth baby. Uh, She gave birth to our daughter uh, four weeks premature. She went into labor in the cancer ward in Dublin. She uh, went to the hospital before, went to the toilet before we were due to go back home. She came back saying, I'm bleeding badly. You don't want to hear that four weeks early. And we thought, what's next? So we were just, we didn't know what to do. And uh, I've been a Christian for many years in ministry for 20 years. But I was facing a battle and I didn't know how to fight it. So I'm in this kitchen, I grab a quick cup of tea. And there's a dad in there and he says, uh, we're just small talk and what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I, I work with a Christian charity, you know, a director of a Christian charity. And he said to me, do you mind if I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, how can you believe in a loving God who would allow this to happen to small children? At that time, my reply to him was, well, God is in control of everything. He has a plan. And one day this will make sense. Right now I just have to trust him. And he said, well, let me give you some advice. Don't mention God to my wife. Because if you do, she'll go ballistic and will probably punch you. So I came away from that and I wondered, God, what do I say in this situation? I don't have an answer. And I look around this hospital in the ward and we're despairing, but I'm looking at a lot of families and parents who are angry at God. Well, nothing to do with God because they blame God for the situation. They're turning against God. I will have nothing to do with God ever again. I'll never step inside a church again because look at my child and what God did. And if he had the power to heal, why doesn't he heal my child? Well, we mobilized so many people to pray. And I remember one time I went to a prayer meeting. And in this prayer meeting with a lot of church leaders and various people there, I arrived and they said, Mike's here. And Mike, how would you like us to pray for for Andrew? And I said, pray for him as if he's your own son. And we prayed, and we begged, and we pleaded, and we screamed, and we shouted, and we cried out to God. And I was leading the charge. But you know, I came away from that prayer meeting, and I thought, is this it? I mean, is this it? 
I'm not doubting you, God, but is this it? Is this, do I have to wake you up and get your attention to have mercy on my child? Do I, as a human being, have more compassion on the sick than you do, God? Now, interestingly enough, at the very beginning of this whole thing, when he was diagnosed, uh, people were very good, very gracious. You heard some funny things that people were saying to us. But they were just sincere. You see, they didn't know what to say. I'm not judging them or condemning them. They just didn't know what to say. But someone sent us a CD. <laughs> see, at the time, there was nobody who could pray in faith. Everybody was praying, God, if it's your will, you know. And, but someone sent us a CD, just copied CD and written on it, handwritten, God wants you well. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you. Please don't be offended by this when I say this. When we saw that, we were so raw, the title didn't appeal to us. And so we shelved it. And we kept just seeking God, and trusting God, we thought. And just nothing was happening in just prayers weren't being answered, and we thought, what is going on? We, thought, we actually thought at one stage that God needed a quarter of people praying. Thousands, maybe 10,000 people on Facebook. Then we're going to get it. Then it's going to come. We were using the expression, as were other church members, we're going to storm the gates of heaven. Have you ever heard that expression? I don't know where that comes from. We were storming that gate, and I thought, there's something wrong with this picture. But when we put on that CD... You see, it was like four or five months into it. We were so desperate. We took the CD. We just found it. I can't remember even how we got it off the shelf. We looked at it and we said, well, we're driving to Crumlin. Let's put it on and listen. That was one of the greatest things we ever did. <laughs> we put that CD in the car. We listened to that message. And we looked at each other because the message that we heard, it resonated with our hearts. It sounded so familiar, yet new. I can't explain it. But as if we already knew this but I'd never heard it before. Can you explain that to me? But it resonated with us, and we put on the next CD, and we looked at each other and said, could it be true? And then we began to listen to everything from Andrew Womack. He said, get this. Down. And it's all free. I didn't have to give so much. It was all free. I already had my respect. And we're listening to this and downloading, and it was like water to a part soul. And we were in the hospital. I'm with Andrew. I had to put my hand through the bars in the cot so he would sleep on my hand at night because he was so screaming and afraid. He wanted to make sure Daddy wasn't going anywhere. So he made sure I wasn't going. So he had his head on my hand at night. But I'd have the MP3 player and I'm listening to all these messages. A better way to pray. The believer's authority. I'm thinking, hallelujah. And we said, you know what? And this was the change. You see, all this time we had been praying for victory. It changed. Because we started, well, what we started to do then was to pray from victory. See, we got a victory. And so we, we looked this, we, and, we, and the thing is, you see, our faith, we had put our faith in prayer. <laughs> what we started to do according to the teaching we were getting now was putting our faith in the word of God. In the promises in God's word. That's, a, that's where the change came. Not in prayer. We thought prayer was the answer. Get people praying. Jesus never said, get people praying. He said, go heal the sick. And so we put our faith in the promises in God's word. And we found a promise in Proverbs 15.30 that says, good news makes your bones healthy. Well, there we go. Okay, well, that's, he's got unhealthy bones. He's got cancer in them. God, we're going to stand on this word. Also says in, in Mark 16 that these signs will follow those who believe. People say to me, are you a healer? I say, no, I'm a believer. <laughs> the Bible says these signs will follow those who believe. And I believe. And so he said, well, he says, you, lay, you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. It's very interesting. I've got another revelation in, in Matthew chapter 18. Because we thought we had to get thousands. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, he says this. This is a revelation. In verse 19, again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. We didn't need thousands of people to pray. <laughs> two would do. We just had to agree. He's only 17 months, two years. We agreed. And we laid hands. And we spoke to his bones. I'd never spoken to bones before in my life. We spoke to his bones. 
He said, Bones, I got a message from God. Can't say you're not of God. You have no benefit to our son. Jesus already paid the price. It's done. It's finished. We're praying from victory in the name of Jesus by the power of attorney given to us in the name of Jesus Christ and according to God's word. Get out of our son. Get out and don't come back. Be gone right now. Father, we thank you that you've, you've paid the price for our son's healing. Well, not long afterwards, we got a call from our consultant. And she said, uh, Mike, I took the phone and we put her on speaker. She said, I um, don't know how to tell you this, but everything regarding Andrew's up in the air. I said, is it up in the air good or up in the air bad? She said, Mike, it's up in the air good. All Andrew's bones are completely clean of cancer. Now, hear this. I want you to hear this. Because if she said to us, well, you know, there's a, it's not good, and this, that wouldn't have changed where we were at. You hear me? You hear me? Because we were, our faith was not on our experience. Our faith was on what God's Word said. You've got to hear that. That's very important. But you know what? That began us in this incredible journey. We saw our son healed. And we said to people, people said, how would you like us to pray for Andrew? I said, give thanks. <laughs> for what? I said, he's healed. Well, shouldn't we ask God and just continue to pray? I said, don't. I said, if you want to pray, just give thanks. Because we did. We prayed. In fact, when we prayed and rebuked that cancer, we also gave thanks. We said, it's done. It's finished. And you know what? When he had to go into, into transplant, and my wife got a great word in Judges 3 about Ehud and Eglon, the king of Moab. You know, the Bible is a word. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Did you know that? Did you know that Ehud had a, had a, a dagger? a two-edged dagger that he stuck into the king of Eglon and he left it in there, went into the belly of him. And what we did was with the word of God, we planted it right in there to his body. We said, we're leaving it there and it's just going to do its work. You know what? God has really changed us massively. I will admit it's not popular. (laughs) I thought everybody would be excited. Someone said to me, someone said to me, you know what? This whole thing with healing, you got to realize it ended with the apostles. There is no healing today. I said, so you got to stop talking about healing. you got to shut up and not talk about healing. Everything can be fine and we can just go on as normal. And I said, I'm going to let you into a little secret. I have a weakness. When I get excited about something, I can't shut up. I can't keep, I can't keep my mouth quiet. I can't. I am so excited about Jesus Christ, about the finished work of who I am in Jesus Christ, as he is, so are we in this world. And it's a good news message that the world has got to hear. Let me just share this just before I close. That, you know what, it didn't just stop there. Because then we just, I remember, can I tell one or two stories just of people? Because we've just seen in the last year and a half, uh, at least 100 people healed. Because I can't keep it to myself. Let me just tell you one, one or two very quick, just to encourage you. Um, I was in there, when we were in the transplant, just one of the first ones, there was a lady there, and there was a little child, five months old, beside us. This is very beginnings with us. And uh, one evening I saw all these doctors and nurses together, and it looked really serious, and half eight at night, that's a very serious thing. And uh, later on then, I, I met the, the parent in the sluice room. Those of you who've been in a cancer ward or hospital, you know what a sluice room is. And um, in there, here's this mother of nine from the west coast of Ireland crying over a washing machine. And I said to her, are you okay? Bit of a dumb question. Obviously, it wasn't. And she said, Mike, I just got some really bad news. The doctor came in and the consultant and all the doctors gathered around her. And I was up at the top of the bed rubbing my little girl's head. And then I saw, as they were talking to the consultant, the consultant started to cry. And I came and said, well, someone please tell me what's wrong with my little baby. And the consultant said, well, if God is here and you, you are here, your girl, your little baby is here. She's nearly with God. She's got organ failure. All the organs are shutting down. And uh, we haven't got any room in intensive care. And we're going to put a, a doctor and two nurses here, but we don't expect her to live the night. And something rose up inside of me. I've been too long in cancer wards, and I've, I've seen children get amputated, get legs amputated, and still die. And I'm, I'm, I'm sick 
of what Satan is getting away with. I said, no more. We've got to bring this message to the world. And something rose up inside of me, a righteous anger. And I said, I want to tell you something. I want to teach you something. And I want you to do something. I said, what I want to tell you is that God loves you. He loves your daughter. He didn't give this cancer. He has nothing to do with it. He has sent his son Jesus, who's paid the price, who's risen from the dead. Put your faith and trust in what he has done. By faith in him, lay your hands on your daughter and speak to the liver. Speak to the kidney and tell it that by his stripes, you're healed. Right? I laid hands on her, spoke in tongues with authority in the name of Jesus. I said, I'm going away over to the Ronald McDonald house. I'm coming back later on. And if you do what I say, hear me. If you do what I say, I promise she will live. She will not die. I promise you that. I went away, half eight. I come back at at midnight. My wife came and said, you've got to get over. Something's going on over in the transplant unit. All right? I go over. I get over, get washed up. I went in. When I went there... There's no doctors and nurses by this little baby anymore. It's just a mom up rubbing the baby's head, right? So I go over and I said, psst, I'm not going to tell you her name, right? We'll call her Mary. Hey, Mary. Well, she turned around and she looked at me. This is no joking. Her face was glowing. She said, her first words out of her mouth, you're a saint, <laughs> right? I said, thank you. <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> That's a revelation. And, I, and I, she said, a miracle has just happened. I said, um, what? She said, Mike, I never had anybody tell me the things that you told me. I'd never had anybody pray for me the way you prayed for me. But something happened in my heart when you put your hand on me and you start praying for me, telling me these things. Something happened in my heart. When you left, I went to the chapel there in Crumlin Hospital in Dublin. And I said, okay. She said, you know the chapel? I said, I know the chapel. She said, there's a cross at the front. I said, I know the cross. Now she said, I got nine kids. I'm, you know, I don't go to chapel very much. And she started confessing. I said, it's okay, relax. She said, well, anyways, I went to the front. I said, you know that big cross? I said, I, I know it. She said, I went up to the front and I stood at the bottom, the foot of that big cross. And she said, Mike, do you ever see in these programs in America, you know, where they put their hands in the air in these churches, you, you know? I said, I think I know what you mean. <laughs> she said, I stood there at the foot of this cross with my hands in the air. And in a loud voice, I cried out, Jesus, I need you. And this is powerful. And she said, and I couldn't care less who was looking at me. I tell you this, the fear of man is what hinders a lot of people receiving healing and stepping up for Jesus. I said, so what did you do then? She said, I went back to the transplant. And then I went in, I asked the doctors and nurses, I said, excuse me, I need to do something. I said, uh, what did you do? She said, I did what you told me. I said, I put my hands on, I spoke to the liver, I spoke to the kidney. I said, in the name of Jesus, by his stripes, you are healed. I said, what happened? She said, within 30 minutes, she started to pee. <laughs> started to pee. Have you ever been so excited to hear someone pee? Come on. And then, and then she said, within two hours, she was off the critical list, had made a miraculous recovery. And so there are so many stories like that. You know, people getting healed. A lady, stroke, seven years, instantly healed because I told her about the love of Jesus. All you got to do is receive it. She said, is it that simple? I said, it is. It's called good news. She received it, totally set free, instantly. She's in Donegal, not West Africa. And just, just two, three weeks ago, I had a colleague in work. Had a short leg since the age of four because of an accident. And I told him, God wants to heal him. God wants him well. I said, if you want, I'll pray and your leg will grow. He said, do you think so? I said, no, I don't think so. I know so. <laughs> totally. And I went and I prayed with him. You know what happened to that leg? I don't have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I was kneeling down, holding the legs one shorter than the other. And right before his eyes, it grew. He said, look at this, it's growing. I said, now I'm not pulling your leg. Um, yeah, I'm, it's, it grew. Do you know, a week later, he came back. He's telling everybody. He's telling everybody. This is so exciting. He had bad arthritis in that hip, and it was stiff. This was only the other week, two, three weeks ago. And I spoke to that arthritis. He said, would you pray for me? I said, surely. I spoke to the arthritis. And it left. And the pain left. The pain left. He's healed. We're seeing many things like this. And my heart is really to teach people about the goodness of God. You know what? We've already got it. (laughs) We have it. We've already got it. God is good. Praise his holy name. Amen.
That's yeah, awesome, you. brother. God bless you so much. You bless us. Thank you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Wow. That's powerful, isn't it? And you know, I just want to point this out. It ought to be obvious, but I didn't pray for little Andrew. I didn't do a thing. The body of Christ has primarily been taught that God only anoints certain individuals with special things and everybody else is dependent on going to them to get their miracle. And I've had, I've had dozens of people this uh, meeting already come up that I am the only one that can pray for them. They're looking to me and God does have people in the body of Christ with special gifts of healing, but I'm not one of them. I don't have that gift. The miracles that I've seen happen exactly the way Mike was describing, just because I believe. I'm a believer, not a healer. And this is an illustration of what I've been trying to teach, that if you would grab hold of the Word of God and believe it, the Word of God will bring healing to you. Psalms 107, 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them. It's the truth that makes you free. Mike and his family heard the truth and it was the word. It was the truth of God's word that produced the healing and all of these other healings, everything. It's because of the word and every one of us have access to this. And I'm telling you, we're trying to redirect your faith. So that it's away from individuals, which again, there's nothing wrong with God using people. It is a tremendous honor to be uh, called and anointed by God to tell the truth. But it is not an individual. It's the Word of God. And it will work exactly the same for you as it works for Mike and his family. There's not a person in here that can't receive the Word. The Word's not the problem. It's the fact that people don't believe the Word. They don't mix it with faith. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says, The word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. That's the only thing that stops the power of God's word from working is the fact that people don't mix it with faith. So man, I just love that testimony. That's my first time to ever meet Mike. And look what's happened. And it wasn't through me. It was through the word of God. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jesus. I tell you what, if that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet. (laughs) What a great gift we have. What an awesome gift we have. It's a shame that so many people have multiple copies of the Bible at home and yet are just dying of sickness, depression, fear, discouragement. They don't have any hope. They're they're fearful, all of these kind of things. And yet the answer for every problem that you've got is sitting right here. Many of us carry it under our arm and it just, it's got to get off of these pages and into your heart in order to do any good. And that's awesome. That is powerful. I tell you what, we've already heard a great message. And you know the sad thing, I don't know all of the details, but Andrew told me he worked for a major Christian ministry, a large Christian ministry for nearly 10 years. And did you know when this happened, he had to leave. If his son would have died, they would have loved him and said, we understand you're blessed. But because he got healed and he started telling people about it, he's no longer welcome. Isn't that amazing? Religion is terrible. Religion killed Jesus and it's killing everybody who's in it. We need to get into the true gospel. Man, thank you, Jesus. What a great, great testimony. Thank you, Father.